Hello, 
welcome to an adventure, everybody. I hope that you are having a good Wednesday. Um, welcome to Archival Adventures. I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And uh, we're streaming to you live from Newman Library. Um, I would say live from the archives, but we're not in the archives. We're up on the second floor in um, one of the uh, classroom spaces that is available for doing remote instruction. Um, so uh, if you are unfamiliar, this is a program that I do once a week on Wednesdays. Um, and it goes out to two channels on Twitch. Uh, so we are live right now on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, which is the University Library's channel, uh, as well as my own personal channel, twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Uh, so if you are watching and you hear me saying things to people in chat and you don't see those things in chat, they're probably on the other channel. Um, and so either that or I'm making them up and I don't know that it really matters either way, um, because I see you all. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you all for joining me. Welcome. Um, and thank you, uh, Lord Portico, for giving the shout out to the VTUL Studios channel. Indeed, um, there is good content beyond this show on uh, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. Um, there is an ongoing series where um, a couple of our uh, faculty have located a board game in our archival collections and have been analyzing it um, and are going to be reproducing it using our maker spaces up on the fourth floor and then playing it on stream. Um, so I don't remember what that one's called, but that one has been on Mondays, I believe. Um, there's 3D design, there's uh, music making um, in like using digital tools to make music, uh, things like that, um, as well as uh, occasional TTRPG content. Um, I know I've GM'd twice on the channel and I've played in four or five sessions. Um, they are fewer and further between now, but they're still happening. So, um, yeah, if you follow, you'll have a chance to see those things as they come up. Um, I do want to say uh, welcome to the people that I already see in chat. So, Lord Portico, thank you so much for being here. Um, and, uh, Obi, um, uh, Lord Portico is indeed correct. I do not have the materials with me today to be able to do a hat trick for you. Um, so, I can do that. Uh, next time you pop into stream, just remind me, and I owe you a hat trick. Um, I should actually just, like, supply one, because now that I have the um, earbuds in instead of the full-on headphones, I could do one. I just need to have another hat here <laughs> to be able to make that happen. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if you come back next week for Archival Adventures, I will try to have at least one other hat on hand so that I could actually execute the hat trick. Um, and hi, Hannah, welcome. Um, I think I'm actually gonna try and steer us into content a little bit faster this week. Um, if there is anything off with the balance on the audio, do let me know. I tried, I, I'm still trying to figure out how I can adjust the volume of the music more directly um, I don't know where the levels are set. I, I see, I tracked where it's going into the board, but I don't see the dial that controls the volume of that on the board. Um, I can't control the audio for the music um, in the uh, mixed multi-item device on my computer. I can't find anything in the Pearl. Uh, so this setup uh, streams using a Pearl tube from Epifan. Um, I have not located audio controls in there. So the only control I have over the audio of the music is in Pretzel Rocks. And it is set very low. It's usually around 10% or less. 
which doesn't allow for a lot of adjustment. If I could locate some sound levels somewhere else, I could adjust that better. Um, great, thank you for letting me know that the sound seems decent this week. Um, I think it is about time uh, to pop in with our normal start of the stream, which is a quick look at um, the land acknowledgement and labor recognition, as well as at what we're gonna be looking at from the archives today. Quickly before I do that, because I almost forgot, um, I do have one promo to do, which is coming up tomorrow. If you happen to be in the Blacksburg, Virginia area, um, and you want to stop by campus uh, tomorrow at 5.15 p.m. Uh, from 5.15 until 7.30 here, first floor of Newman Library in the Special Collections Reading Room, there is an open house, a Women's Stories in the Archives celebrating Women's History Month. Um, so if you happen to be in the area and you want to stop by uh, and take a look at some women's history items uh, from our collections, they will be on display in the reading room and you're welcome to drop in. I'm not curating that one, so I don't know exactly what's being pulled, but um, I'm sure it'll be a good time. I'm also uh, still working out the final details, but I likely will be live for a couple of hours on a Saturday from the archives, actually streaming from the reading room. Um, so watch for that, potentially. Uh, I'll know for certain by next week, um, but that is coming up on April 1st um, because I'll be down there uh, with the reading room open and I thought, might as well stream. Um, that is uh, for the 75th anniversary of WUVT, which is the uh, university's uh, radio station. So we're going to have an exhibit and the reading room is going to be open for a little bit on Saturday, uh, which is the 75th anniversary of when they started broadcasting. All right. We like to start off the stream with uh, just a look at these. So... If you want to bring them up on your own screen, the links are there in the chat. Um, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute and they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to IPROSIM, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So, what we are focused on today from the archives is the Girl Scouts of the United States of America. Um, and the reason we're looking at the Girl Scouts of America today is that Sunday was their 11th birthday. 
Uh, and if you're not familiar with Tolkien speak from the Lord of the Rings, um, 111st is 111th birthday. Um, and I just, when I saw that that was a thing, hang on one second, I have a thing to pull up. Um, I have it bookmarked, but of course, neglected to actually load it before stream. Um, so Sunday was the 111th birthday of the Girl Scouts of America. And I saw that that birthday was coming up uh, approximately nine months ago, I think, and uh, dropped this topic on the calendar for a stream all the way back then. I was excited. Um, I don't remember what initially triggered it. I think I noticed that we had something Girl Scouts related in the collection. Uh, and that that is what um, caused me to think of it. And then I wanted to associate the stream with their birthday if I could. Uh, and when I looked it up, I was just like, this is great. Knowing my audience, um, that little reference to Tolkien with 11 first uh, would be really good. Uh, so the Girl Scouts of America has special events going on all week this week in honor of their birthday. Um, today happens to be uh, Go Outside Day or Get Outside Day, I think. Uh, yeah, Get Outdoors. So today, getting outside is an essential piece of the Girl Scout experience. There's no better way to celebrate, celebrate Girl Scout Week than with exploration and adventure. We're on an adventure right now, although it's indoors. Uh, <laughs> Check out programs like the Girl Scout Tree Promise to get started. Um, and then also coming up later this week, they've got, uh, it looks like Throwback Thursday happening. Um, and so they're wanting people to uh, tag them on various socials, it looks like. Um, Friday, Girl Scout Jumma celebrates the powerful ties between Girl Scouting and Faith. and also uh, Girl Scout Sabbath or Shabbat, uh, besides reflecting on your beliefs and how they ec they're echoed in the Girl Scout law, I urge you to take some time to learn something new about someone else's, else's faith. So those are the other things that they have coming up later this week. Earlier this week, they did, um, they had Girl Scouts Sunday, which was the 111th birthday itself. Uh, Monday was make new friends and Tuesday was take action. So, To mark the 111th birthday of the Girl Scouts of America, I looked through our, our archival collections to see what I could find that was re related to the Girl Scouts. Um, and I found, honestly, more than I was expecting. <laughs> so the focus today is going to be for us to actually look at those. Um, the finding aid that is available uh, linked in chat is um, a link to this Google Doc that has links to individual finding aids because we're looking at items from multiple collections today as well as some rare books instead of just a single collection. Uh, but you can see here I've got a collection called Girl Scout Guides and Policy Pamphlets that dates back uh, 1925 to 1948. We have two folders from the Jean Linden Young Papers, um, which is one of multiple uh, items that I found within the International Archive of Women in Architecture. Uh, we have the Jane Hall Johnson Architectural Collection. We've got one folder from that. We have Alberta Pfeiffer's Architectural Collection, uh, one folder there. I have the uh, I have a one over, oversized folder, sorry, with architectural drawings in it from the Rebecca Wood Watkin Architectural Collection, um, as well as a folder from the Zelma Wilson Architectural Collection. <clears throat> as and then I do also have a pamphlet from the Culinary Pamphlet Collection, and then various items from our Rare Books Collection, including Tramping and Trailing with the Girl Scouts from 1927. Uh, a 1928 edition of Kettles and Campfires, um, 
Girl, the Girl Scout Handbook from 1930, uh, Cooking Out of Doors from 1946, The Beginner's Cookbook from 1972, and The Girl Scout Cookbook from 1973, and then a reprint of the 1928 Kettles and Campfires from 2007. So these are the items available for us to look at today. If you see one of those and you're just like, oh my gosh, we need to make sure that we absolutely see this, it's wonderful, um, throw it in chat, let me know, because we typically do not get through everything that I have um, put on the cart. So if there's something you wanna make sure that we get to, uh, be sure to let me know and I'll make sure that we get to it. So let's start. And, um, I don't know, I'm going to pull out, I think, I think a good starting place is always the handbook. Um, I actually don't know a whole lot about Girl Scouts, uh, beyond cookies and friendship and service. Like, in my head, Girl Scouts is cookies and friendship and service. I don't know how accurate that is. Um, I had no sisters. <laughs> I was in the Boy Scouts. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know much. But I think I will probably learn something today. Uh, so the first item that we have to look at is the Girl Scout Handbook, and like I said, this is from 1930. Um, I may actually pull out a foam block just to just to be nice to the spine of this book. It, it's not in bad condition, um, but I also want to support it. They have badges they can earn. Yes, you did a whole thing with a troop helping them get their jewelry badge a few years ago. That's cool. So like, I know like similar to the Boy Scouts, there are merit badges where you do something and you can earn a badge to go on your sash. And that is, that's common to both of them. Um, and there are some pretty cool things. I remember, uh, back when I was in Boy Scouts. I remember when they added the videography uh, badge and Steven Spielberg like was at the Jamboree and announced it, uh, or cinematography badge, I think it was, um, for the Boy Scouts. But like, like I said, I don't know a whole lot about the Girl Scouts. So uh, that's honestly what I'm hoping to learn today is, is more, because I, I want to celebrate them. I think, um, as an organization, they have been around for 111 years, and I would say they generally have a good reputation, uh, which is not necessarily an easy thing. Uh, that, that is nothing to laugh at at this point. Um, so I, I, I want to celebrate that. Um, so as you can see, the handbook has some handwriting in it. Really? Boy Scouts has been rebranded to Scouts BSA since all children may join Scouts. Oh, I did not know about that. Uh, about the rebrand. I knew um, that it was open for everybody to join now, which is a change. When I was, when I was in it, uh, it was definitely um, for boys. And it wasn't until you got like around age 18 when you weren't allowed to be in Boy Scouts anymore. Uh, they had what were called Explorer Scouts, which was like the next level, and you could join that, and that uh, could have all, all genders in it. Um, but it is really nice to, to hear that they have uh, expanded and been more welcoming. Okay, I'm trying to make out this uh, handwriting. It is in pencil. It is handwriting and not print, so I'm having to zoom in a bit. Uh, 
Uh, it looks like a, probably like a campfire song sort of like thing. Uh, your ears are... I can't make out, it's broken into syllables, but I, I, I can't make it. Your ears are uh, something long. Yes, my Lord does not put on wrong. I don't, I don't know. Your something are, again, the phrasing that I just am not making out. Uh, and then red. Interesting. It's a rhyme. I'm almost dead. Yes. That, that is definitely what the second half of it says. Yes, my lord, I'm almost dead. You're in a... Unity habit. I think it's unity. U-N-I dash T. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that has meaning. I don't know. I could see cabbage. Yes, I could see the word cabbage. Uh, eh. I mean, this isn't part of the official, like, published work. Uh, I just thought it was, I saw handwriting and I was like, we should take a, take a look at that and see if we can make out what it says. Um, the end is like, uh, and your lips can carry a song. Yeah, I don't know. The, the last two lines are, uh, if your heart can carry a kindly word and your lips can carry a song. Um, anyway, 1930s uh, book here, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's when that was written. Um, there is a name, Mary, New Mary Lou Snelling. Um, there's also a couple of little postcard things here. That were stuck in the front of it. Uh, this card to new leaders. I can bump it out again. The rank requirements found in this handbook and the badge requirements in the badge pamphlet which accompanies it have been revised since the handbook was published. The revised rank and badge requirements will be found in the April, May, and June 1938 issues of The Girl Scout Leader. The requirements found in the handbook and the badge pamphlet may be used until July 1st, 1939 if desired. New leaders, however, are encouraged to use the revised requirements. If you are a leader who has registered since May 1st, 1938, you are entitled to a free copy of the re revised requirements, which will be ready on June 1st, 1938. Um, please fill out and return the attached card to receive this material. So that's... This card being in here is sort of indicating that this book was in use for like a decade at least because this book was published in 1930. And that's talking about 38, 39. Um, and the other one is an order form for, uh, oh, it's the attached card, which apparently they never sent back. So, <laughs> um, I do like the cover of this. The, the illustration on the cover, I think, is really, really nice. Um, we, we will get to content, but... Hi, I'm Puddle Glum. Yeah, uh, it is... Um, this week was the 111th birthday of the Girl Scouts of America, so that is what we are focused on today. Um, this is the handbook from 1930, and the illustration, I presume, for 1930, that these are all meant to be Girl Scouts in silhouette. And so you've got this silhouette on the left, 
You leveled book covers? Yeah. Hi, Fluid Anne. There was indeed um, uh, the portions of the United States that observe daylight savings time uh, shifted forward by an hour uh, this past weekend, as well as I believe the portions of Canada that observe it also shifted this past weekend. And we've got about another week and a half and then I know uh, some portions of Europe will be changing their clocks. Ooh, Fluidan, thank you so much for the resubscription. 14 months. Sometimes I, I marvel at how long it has been. Um, so the silhouette on the left is very like flapper-esque 1920s, uh, that slim line, looks like they're in a skirt, they've got like a cloche hat. Um, the one in the middle with the walking stick, probably still in a skirt, but it almost looks like it's just baggy shorts. It looks like they've got some short hair and, and just kind of more tomboyish um, out on an adventure. And then the one here, I'm uncertain. I, I'm not sure what this bag is. I think it's just a backpack, but um, they're up on their toes. They're really curious. They're pointing like up at the bird or something. I love this illustration. Uh, Puddle Glum, entirely possible. Those could be bloomers. But a uh, 1930s rucksack, you're probably right, Obi-Wan. Um, so I, I love the illustration here. I think it's great. I think it shows, at a quick glance, it shows three very different girls all as part of the Scouts. And that, I think, um, I think that's great. It is a dynamic illustration. I, um, I wanted to use this for the like promo image, like what you saw on the starting soon screen. Um, but because of the texture of the book cover, it did not scan well at all. Um, which is why instead you ended up with uh, the logo from the inside um, as the promotional image, but um, they did not fill out the, the front part where they uh, indicated who the book belonged to. 1930, there is a dedication in the handbook to Juliet Lowe, their founder, in grateful acknowledgement of all that she has done for them, the American Girl Scouts dedicate this handbook. So, once we actually start getting in here, I'm actually gonna grab a bean bag to hold down pages. Um, we've got printed photograph in the book, marketing at Camp Andre, the National Girl Scout Camp at Briarcliff Manor in New York. Um, that looks like it's probably the sort of outfit that the middle individual on the cover was wearing. Um, this is the revised edition of September 1930, incorporating changes in badges from 1931. Um, and so this actual copy of the 1930 handbook was reprinted. So this is a reprint um, from January of 1932. Um, so this is the 1930 handbook, but printed in 1932 and incorporating changes from 1931. Copyright 1920 by Girl Scouts Incorporated. Revised edition, copyright 1929. All right, I think, I think we should take a look at the forward. Okay, how scouting began. I'm gonna drop this down to the actual table level here so it's more flat. How did scouting come to be used by girls? 
Uh, that is what I've been asked. Well, it was this way. In the beginning, I had used scouting, that is, woodcraft, handiness, and cheery helpfulness, as a means for training young soldiers when they first joined the army, to help them become handy, capable men and able to hold their own with anyone instead of being mere drilled machines. You have read about the wars in your country against the, uh, against the indigenous folk, uh, of the gallantry of your soldiers against the cunning of the indigenous people, and what is more, of the pluck of your women on those dangerous frontiers. Um, thank you, Hannah, for dropping the historical terms uh, note into the chat. Um, we are looking at historic items, and it is not uncommon to encounter um, out-of-date language uh, where possible. If I catch it, I will substitute out uh, more modern phrasing um, for the words that are um, potentially offensive as best I can. But these are historic items and um, yeah, sometimes we encounter ideas that whose time has come and gone. Um, well, we have had much the same sort of thing in South Africa. Wait, is this a South African edition? Wait, I'm confused. This is, this is the Girl Scouts of America. Indeed it is. Uh, maybe I just need to read on and, and I will learn more. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. Um, well, we have had much the same sort of thing in South Africa. Over and over again, I have seen where the wonderful bravery and resourcefulness of the women uh, when the tribes of Zulu or Matabales, that word I am unfamiliar with, um, have been out on the warpath against the white settlers. Again, um, sort of the way that they're being described here removes a little bit of their humanity. Or, you know, a lot of it. Um, but again, historical materials. Uh, in the Boer, uh, Boer War, blah, blah, Boer, Boer, I don't remember how it's said, of course, now that I actually have to read the word. Uh, in the Boer War, a number of women volunteered to help my forces as nurses or otherwise. They were full of pluck and energy, but unfortunately they had never been trained to do anything. And so with all the goodwill in the world, they were of no use. I'm getting the sense that this is written by a man. Boer. Thank you, Obi-Wan. <clears throat> I could not help feeling how splendid it would be if one could only train them in peacetime in the same way one trained y the young soldiers, that is, through scout craft. I afterwards took to training boys in that way, uh, but I had not been long at it before the girls came along and offered to do the very thing I had hoped for. They wanted to take up scouting too, or also. They did not merely want to be imitators of the boys. They wanted a line of their own. So I gave them a smart blue uniform and the names of guides, and my sister wrote an outline of the scheme. The name guide appealed to the British girls because uh, the pick of our frontier forces in India is the Corps of Guides. The term cavalry or infantry hardly describes it since it is composed of all around handy men ready to take on any job in the campaigning line and do it well. Then too, a woman who can be a good and helpful comrade to her brother or husband or son along the path of life is really a guide to him. The name guide, therefore, just describes the members of our sisterhood who, besides being handy and ready for any kind of duty, are also a jolly happy family and likely to be good, cheery comrades to their mankind. Oh boy. It is Lord Baden-Powell, um, Obi-Wan. Uh, now that I see the end of the note, it, this note is written by Robert Baden-Powell, the same person who founded the Boy Scouts of America. Um, 
The coming of the Great War gave the Girl Guides their opportunity, and they quickly showed the value of their training by undertaking a variety of duties which made them valuable to their country in her time of need. My wife, Lady Baden-Powell, was elected by the members to be the chief guide, and under her the movement has gone ahead at an amazing pace, spreading to most foreign countries. It is thanks to Mrs. Juliet Lowe of Savannah that the movement was successfully started in America, and though the name Girl Scouts has there been used, it is all part of the same sisterhood, working to the same ends and living up to the same laws and promise. If all the branches continue to work together and become better acquainted with each other as they continue to become bigger, it will mean a great step forward. If the women of the different nations are to be a large ex are to a large extent members of the same society and therefore in close touch and sympathy with each other, although belonging to different countries, they will make a real bond not merely between the governments but between the peoples themselves, and they will see to it that it means peace, and that we have no more war. Robert Baden-Powell, May 1919. <laughs> um, hey, I am here to share the items. We can talk about where they are problematic, uh, but yes, I do, I do occasionally squirm. Um, that is a thing that happens because sometimes there's not, not, some of the ideas are not necessarily great ones for today. <clears throat> anyway, I, this is an interesting way to start a book. Since much of the material of the handbook is out of date, Although this is the preface explaining why there's a new edition, so I guess it makes sense. This abridged, uh, ab this abridged edition, omitting obsolete sections, has been prepared for use until a new handbook can be published. So, are they referring to the 1932 publication of the 1930 handbook incorporating changes from 1931? as the abridged edition? I'm uncertain. Um, but we get some, some names, uh, people being acknowledged, and um, while I don't know that I will know any of the names, I immediately see some associations omitting obsolete portions. Yeah. So Miss Sarah Louise Arnold, Dean, and Miss Ula M. Dow, A.M., and Dr. Alice Blood of Simmons College. Um, right up front there in the acknowledgments, Simmons College, for the part entitled Home Economics. Sir Robert Baden-Powell for frequent references and excerpts from Girl Guiding. Dr. Samuel Lambert uh, for the part on First Aid, and Dr. W.H. Rockwell for reading and criticizing this. Uh, Miss Marie Johnson, with the assistance of Miss Isabel Stewart of Teachers College for the part entitled Home Nursing. Dr. Herman M. Biggs for reading and criticizing the parts dealing with public health and child care. Mr. Ernest Thompson Seaton and the Woodcraft League and Doubleday Page and Company for the section and plates on Woodcraft. Joseph Parsons, uh, James Wilder and Horence Keppert and the Macmillan Company for the material in the section Camping for Girl Scouts. David Hunter for the Girl Scouts' own garden. Uh, Ellen Shipman for the part on per a perennial border with the specially prepared drawing. I'm curious about that. In the section on the garden. Uh, Mr. Sereno Stetson for material in measurements, map making, and knots. Raymond Brown for the test for citizen. Edith L. Nichols, supervisor of drawing in the New York Public Schools for the test on craftsmen. Are those ranks or are those badges for the Girl Scouts? Citizen and craftsman. Uh, when it talks about tests, it's making me think of um, advancing from one level to the next. It could be badges though, you're right. 
I suppose we'll find out as we progress through uh, perusing the manual or the handbook. They don't look like ranks. Okay. Francis Hunter Elwin of the New York School of Fine and Applied Arts for devising and drawing certain of the designs for proficiency badges and the plates for signaling. L.S. Power, or Miss L.S. Power, Miss Mary Davis, and uh, Miss Mabel Williams of the New York Public Library. Uh, love to see a library call out. Uh, for assistance in the preparation of reference and general reading for Girl Scouts, Mrs. Josephine Dask and Bacon, who as chairman of publications originally compiled and edited this book. It is evident that only a profound conviction of the high aims of the Girl Scout movement and the practical capacity of the organization for realizing them could have induced so many distinguished persons to give so generously of their time and talent to this handbook. All right. Uh, section one is the history of the American Girl Scouts. Two is the principles. Three is organization. Four, requirements for ranks. Five, forms for Girl Scout ceremonies. Six, what a Girl Scout should know about the flag. Seven, knots and their uses. Eight, sign language and signaling. Nine, observation through tracking and stalking. Ten, pathfinding and measuring. Eleven, the Girl Scout nature trail. Uh, Twelve, the Girl Scout's own garden. Uh, Thirteen, outdoor Girl Scout. Fourteen, woodcraft. From the Woodcraft Manual for Girls, 1918, by Ernest Thompson Seton, Doubleday Page and Company. The name Ernest Thompson Seton is like dinging a bell for me. I think he also is the one who wrote the Woodcraft stuff for the Boy Scouts uh, that was used, and Seton Hall, and yeah. I'm thinking it's the same person that Seton Hall is named after, but I'm not certain. I would have to, I'd have to do some digging. Um, to confirm that, but like, anyway. Uh, 15, the homemaker. 16, the child nurse. 17, first aid in accidents and emergencies. 18, the home nurse. 19, the health guardian. 20, health in the community. 21, Girl Scout proficiency and special badges. And 22, reference reading for Girl Scouts, Girl Scout publications, and then index. Um, it's interesting here to me, just sort of the subjects. Uh, very different, I would say, than uh, stuff presented to the Boy Scouts. Um, some of it is similar, but a lot of it is different. Um, both have knots as a thing that definitely gets presented, but otherwise, um, sign language and signaling, you do get, uh, I know in Boy Scouts, there's some um, like semaphore and stuff like that, that I remember being introduced in the handbook. Uh, but the idea of sign language um, being so prominent to get its, in its own section. Uh, observation through tracking and stalking. Um, pathfinding and measuring, I'm more familiar with under the heading orienteering. Um, they do get woodcraft in here, but then there's the homemaker, the child nurse, first aid uh, in accidents and emergencies, the home nurse, the health guardian, health in the community. There's like, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, five sections all about health and caring for the health of others. Um, as compared with uh, what I know or what I remember of Boy Scouts where, yeah, there was a section on first aid. One. There are five sections out of 22 that are about health or first aid in some way. Yes, there was ASL. It was just the alphabet in the, in the Boy Scout handbook. And Public Lem, uh, let me know what you find. Um, I do think we should look at history and then we can jump around a little bit after that. Um, really? I did not know this. And it, it is surprising to me 
mainly because be prepared is also the Boy Scouts motto. I did not know that the Girl Scouts had the same motto. Uh, the slogan here is do a good turn daily, but their motto, be prepared, is, is the same as the Boy Scouts motto. Um, and then it looks like the trefoil to indicate threefold promise. Their promise, on my honor I will try to do my duty to God and my country to help other people at all times and to obey the Girl Scout laws. Uh, phrasing is similar here as to the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, gosh. I'm trying to see if I can remember it. It has been more than 20 years probably close to 25 years. On my honor, I will do my duty to do my best to God and my country to help other people at all times. Yeah, I don't remember all of it, but that was that was basically how the Boy Scouts one started. Um, so very similar. It's also similar to the current as of 96 phrase. <laughs> Wait. Boy Scouts of America was also do a good turn daily. I guess maybe I never knew that. Um, let's see, they're, so the Boy Scouts, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. The Girl Scouts, we've got trusted, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, friend to animals. Uh, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, clean. So almost, almost the same. A uh, Girl Scout's honor is to be trusted. Uh, a Girl Scout is loyal. A Girl Scout's duty is to be useful and to help others. A Girl Scout is a friend to all and a sister to every other Girl Scout. A Girl Scout is courteous. A Girl Scout is a friend to animals. A Girl Scout obeys orders. A Girl Scout is Cheerful, a Girl Scout is thrifty, a Girl Scout is clean in thought, word, and deed. <clears throat> uh, the Cub Scouts adopted the BSA oath as well. Uh, they used to be separate. I did not know that. I honestly have not paid a whole lot of attention since um, probably like 92-ish uh, when I left scouting myself. Uh, let's see. The history of the American Girl Scouts. When Sir Robert Baden Powell founded the Boy Scout movement in England, it proved too attractive and too well adapted to youth to make it possible to limit its great opportunities to boys alone. The girls' organization, known in England as the Girl Guides, developed and flourished with equal success. Mrs. Juliet Lowe, an American visitor in England and a personal friend of the father of scouting, realized the tremendous future of the movement for her own country, and with the active and friendly cooperation of the Baden-Powells, she founded the Girl Guides in America, enrolling the first patrols in Savannah, Georgia, in March 1912. They were rechristened the Girl Scouts in a very few months, however, as that name was more appropriate in America. In 1915, national headquarters were established in Washington, D.C., but the following year, they were moved to New York, and the methods and standards of what was to be a nationwide organization became established on a broad, practical basis. Each succeeding year has shown a larger and more enthusiastic body of girls and young women learning in the happiest way how to combine patriotism, outdoor activities, skill in every branch of domestic science, and high standards of community service. The leaders are as enthusiastic as the girls, and together they have their games and various forms of training that encourage teamwork and fair play. For the instruction of the leaders, national training schools are being established all over the country, and schools and churches everywhere are cooperating eagerly with this great recreational movement. Colleges are offering training in Girl Scouting as a serious course for prospective leaders, and prominent citizens in every part of the country are identifying themselves with local councils in a helpful advisory capacity. In the early days of this great country before telephones and telegrams, railroads and automobiles made communications so easy 
and help of all kinds so quickly secured. Men and women, yes, boys and girls too, or yes, and boys and girls too, had to depend very much on themselves and be very handy and resourceful. Our pioneer grandmothers might have been frightened by the sight of one of our big touring cars, or puzzled at how to send a, uh, or puzzled as to how to send a telegram. But they knew an immense number of practical things that have been entirely left out of our lives today. And for pluck and resourcefulness in a tight place, it is to be doubted if we could equal them. They, as well as their brothers, were explorers, hunters, campers, builders, fighters, settlers, and in an emergency, nurses and doctors combined. They could cook and sew, they could make and sail a canoe, they could support themselves indefinitely in the trackless woods, and they knew all the animals and plants for miles around. They could guide themselves by the sun and stars, and they were hardy and sturdy. Oh, Obi-Wan has dropped it in. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country, to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, and to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Yes, that is the Boy Scouts one as compared with the, the one that we see here for the Girl Scouts. On my honor, I will try to do my duty to God and my country, to help other people at all times, and to obey the Girl Scout laws. Um, the Boy Scout manual looks more oriented toward the practical how-to of ascending ranks. Yes. I think you are absolutely correct, Puddle Club. <clears throat> I think this paragraph here, talking about our pioneer grandmothers and how um, how hardy and sturdy they were, able to do everything um, entirely by reliance upon their own wit and pluck, and they could survive out in the wilderness and navigate perfectly by the sun and the stars. I think that is a bit of um, idealization. I, I don't think it's as historically accurate uh, as it purports to be. I think it's a... Looking back at history and what they were capable of through a little bit of a rosy lens. A bit of a fairy tale, yes. <laughs> Not necessarily a bad one if you're trying to inspire children to have some gumption and, and be excited to go get out into the wilderness and, and have fun outdoors and be willing to try to do things for themselves. Like, I, I don't think it's bad as inspiration, but it's not entirely historically accurate. Uh, in the days when our pioneer ancestors left the settlements on the eastern borders of our continent and went far westward, sometimes large groups of settlers together, often the most resourceful and hardy and experienced of the number went ahead to find the best way for the others to follow. They were called the scouts of the expedition. They had to have many sturdy qualities for their valiant volunteer task. They had to have courage and perseverance and endurance, an understanding of the ways of animals and plants, of the meaning of the winds and the waters and the lay of the land. Their success meant the success of those who followed. They made the best trails through the land, and incidentally, they had great fun doing it. Again, a bit of, um, a, a, a bit of, yeah, lies we tell children, yes. And, and this is a bit more of lies we tell children, omitting, um, you know, the... What is the phrase? Uh, omitting the um, very real efforts at genocide that resulted from uh, the push westward um, and the diseases that not only they brought to the indigenous folk, but also that they got just from traveling out into that wilderness. Uh, so it was hard and it sucked, doesn't sell well. Um, 
You found an old eBay listing for a Boy Scout manual of this era. If I want to look at the table of contents. Um, sure, if you, if you want to, I can try and um, bring that up. I do want to stay more focused on the Girl Scouts, but we could glance at that table of contents if, uh, if you want. I forgot what I was trying to open. I, I went and clicked and I was like, oops, what am I doing? What am I doing? Oh yeah, that would totally be fine. For edification. Yeah, no, I just, I wasn't necessarily gonna show it, but I thought maybe um, I could read through what they were uh, just as a point of comparison. Um, <clears throat> Adventure was theirs, and the joy of accomplishment and the satisfaction of great service to others. The Girl Scouts of today, while they have no new lands to scout into, can scout in the new ways, uh, it, or can scout in the new ways of life that our changing civilization has brought us. They find that there can be as much joy in learning the best ways of doing things in our new era as there was in our new and undiscovered country. The best ways to live, to play, to help others. To build a home may be filled with as much adventure in New York or San Francisco today as there was in crossing the Ohio or Mississippi a hundred years ago. Our early history is sprinkled thickly with brave, handy girls who were certainly Girl Scouts, though they never belonged to a patrol nor recited the Girl Scout laws. But they lived the laws, those strong young pioneers, and we can stretch out our hands to them across the years when we read of them. Oh, I mean, it is not distracting to interact with the chat. That is a feature of the show. Oh, and this is, this is very close in time. Or at least... I had thought there was one close in time. There, huh? Well, there's a 1959 handbook in uh, following the link that you. So the table of contents in the 1959 Boy Scouts handbook, as compared, it was there a 1920. Nineteen twenty nine and nineteen thirty. That was what I was hoping to find. I have to scroll down for it. Oh, there it is. Oh gosh. I got distracted by all of the stuff at the top of the listing. Where was the um table of contents? So in comparison. Oh wow. found it. Um, this is 1932 versus the 1929 and 30 or 29 slash 30-ish uh, Boy Scouts of America handbook. The table of contents there was part one, what is scouting? Uh, part two, how to become a tenderfoot scout. Part three, how to become a second class scout. Part four, how to become a first class scout. Part five, merit badge progress. Uh, part six, additional scout craft. And then part seven, appendix. Uh, so yeah, very much broken into how do I, how do I advance in rank? Um, versus this one being divided up, I'd say more topically and honestly probably better as a handbook. Um, I do see the hydrate redeem uh, Lord Portico, thank you. I could definitely use some hydration. <clears throat> That's interesting. Because this is so much focused on like the, t the things you're going to learn. This is the stuff that you're going to learn. Whereas the Boy Scouts handbook is reinforcing hierarchy. Uh, and I had, it's very obvious in comparison of the two. 
All right, so then uh, this history, uh, the next section is Sacagawea. One of the most remarkable was a young indigenous girl who found her way over the pathless mountains, Sacagawea, the bird woman. In 1806, she was brought to Lewis and Clark on their expedition into the great Northwest to act as interpreter between them and the various indigenous tribes uh, they had to encounter. Uh, from the very beginning, when she induced the hostile Shoshones to act as guides, uh, to the end of her daring journey, during which, with her papoose on her back, she led this band of men through hitherto impassable mountain ranges to the Pacific coast, this girl never faltered. Um, we may need to just drop that historical terms uh, note in again, uh, just because it, as we review unedited historical documents on archival adventures, we may encounter words and phrases or content that are derogatory, harmful, or wildly inaccurate uh, now and or in their historical context. P please feel free to step away from the stream as desired for your own safety and well-being. Uh, because... Uh, this is a lies we tell to our children uh, section right right now. Um, yes, Sacagawea did guide Lewis and Clark. That is factual. <laughs> the rest of that... Mm, don't rely on this for your history of the actual events surrounding uh, Lewis and Clark's journey. Um, <clears throat> no dangers of hunger, thirst, cold or darkness were too much for her. From the Jefferson to the Yellowstone, she was the only guide they had on her instinct for the right way, her reading of the sun, the stars and the trees, depended the lives of all of them. When they fell sick, she nursed them. When they lost heart at the wilderness, at the wildness of their venture, she cheered them. Their party grew smaller and smaller. For Lewis and Clark had separated early in the expedition, and a part of Clark's own party fell off when they discovered a natural route over the Continental Divide where wagons could not travel. Later, most of those who remained decided to go down the Jefferson River in canoes, but Clark, still guided by the plucky indigenous girl, persisted in fighting his way on ponyback overland, and after days of this journeying, crowded full of discomforts and dangers, she brought him out in triumph at the Yellowstone, where the river burst out from the lower canyon, and the great northwest was opened up for all time. Wow. Um, there's a lot of historical inaccuracy in that paragraph. Wow. Uh, it certainly paints things in a certain light. And, um, <laughs> fan self in Atten Shay's Johnny Reb. Ma, ah, it seems to be getting hot in here. Oh, Obi Wan. Interesting. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> I don't even. First off, <clears throat> reading through that, it struck me, boy, they're making it seem like Lewis and Clark certainly would never have survived their journey had they not had her along, which probably overstates her importance. Uh, but also, they made it seem like the whole point of the journey was, oh, if we can just push through and find a route to the Yellowstone, then everybody else can just follow us out westward. And like, honestly, it was a journey of exploration. They didn't have a set destination in mind. Um, yes, and thank you, Lord Portico, for dropping um, that link back in there to the, uh, to the land acknowledgement and labor recognition. Boy, howdy. Also, um, Sacagawea was a member of one of the 13 nationally acknowledged Virginia indigenous tribes. Um, 
that destiny seems a lot less manifest when written that way. Oh, well, yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, <clears throat> and this is very focused on her work as a guide, which makes sense um, in that this is for scouting. And they just talked about scouting is literally finding the path into the wilderness um, and then guiding other people along it. Uh, that sort of like service and that was literally what she was doing. So focusing on that makes sense and emphasizing its importance makes sense. She also traveled the world later, like after this journey, she spent time in Europe. She like, she was more than just this uncultured uh, wilderness wild girl that she's portrayed as. Uh, who happened to guide these sophisticated men out into the wilderness as they broke ground for in the Europeans to make their way across the continent. Um, she was a fully realized person who, for reasons of her own, decided to join this expedition and help them to travel the continent. Uh, okay, the women of Oregon have raised a statue to this young explorer, and there she stands in Portland, facing the coast, pointing to the Columbia River where it reaches the sea. Sacagawea had no maps to study. She made maps, and roads have been built over her footsteps. And so we Girl Scouts, not to lose this great spirit, study the stars and the sun and the trees, and try to learn a few of, this, a few of the wood secrets she knew so well. This out-of-door wisdom and self-reliance is the first great principle of scouting. But there is indoor wisdom, too, that awaits Girl Scouts. In every century, it has been woman's work to direct the household, and very largely her responsibility to maintain a happy, efficient, hospitable spirit there. Just the whole idea of there being woman's work and man's work uh just gonna point to that historical context again historical historical text <laughs> is that a help gravestone or a whelp gravestone gotcha that is an interesting emote uh, um, then they have a section on louisa alcott in 1832 not so many years after the famous lewis and clark expedition there was born a little New England girl who would very early in life have become a first-class gr uh, Girl Scout if she had had the opportunity. Her name was Louisa Alcott, and she made that name famous all the world over by the book by which the world's girls know her, Little Women. Her father, though a brilliant man, was a very impractical one, and from her first little story to her last popular book, all her work was done for the purpose of keeping her mother and sisters in comfort. While she was waiting for the money from her stories, she, er she turned carpets, trimmed hats, papered the rooms, made party dresses for her sisters, nursed anyone who was sick, at which she was particularly good, did all the homely, helpful things that neighbors and families did for each other in New England towns then. In those days, little mothers of families could not telephone specialists to help them out in emergencies. There were neither telephones nor specialists. But there were always emergencies, and the Alcott girls had to know what to put on a black and blue spot, and why the jelly failed to gel, and how to hang a skirt, and bake a cake, and iron a tablecloth. Louisa had to entertain family guests and darn the family stockings. Her home had not every comfort and convenience, even as people counted those things then, and without a brisk, clever woman full of what the New Englanders called f faculty, her family would not her family would have been a very unhappy one. With all our modern inventions, nobody has yet invented a substitute for a good all-round woman in a family. And until somebody can invent one, uh, we must continue to fight off our hat, or to, sorry, take off our hats to girls like Louisa Alcott. Imagine uh, what her feelings would have been if someone had told her that she had earned half a dozen merit badges by her knowledge of home economics and her clever writing. 
And let every Girl Scout who finds housework dull and feels that she is capable of bigger things remember this. The woman whose books for girls are more widely known than any such books ever written in America had to drop the pen often and often for the needle, the dishcloth, and the broom. But there was a time in the history of our country when men and women went out into the wilderness with no, uh, with no nearer neighbors than the indigenous folk. Yet, with all the ideals of the New England they left behind them, girls who had to have all the endurance of the young bird woman, and yet keep up the traditions and the habits of the fine old home life of Louisa Alcott. Again, some historical inaccuracy and lies we tell our children. Um, not surprising, honestly, and, and nor did I not expect to encounter this sort of thing. Um, there was a comment in here that I took a moment and just had to blink. Uh, I, I don't see it immediately, but it was something about that every household needed to have a competent woman. Um, and then uh, in the last paragraph of it, um, with no nearer neighbors than the indigenous folk. Exactly, Puddle Glum, but masculine people also need to know how to manage a home. You are not wrong. I'm just gonna control C historical terms to have on hand for the rest of the stream. Um, uh, this whole bit here about women who went out into the wilderness with no nearer neighbors than the indigenous folk, that was honestly probably how they thought about it at the time, too, was like, oh gosh, there are no neighbors out here. The indigenous folk that were already here when I decided to walk over here and say that this land was mine don't count. Uh, but had they just taken a slightly different approach and actually acknowledged that those were fully realized people who actually were very familiar with the area, they would have realized they had neighbors. And if they were nice to them, those neighbors would be perfectly willing to assist them. But no, that's not uh, who the, um, that's not who the colonizers were. Um, okay, Anna Shaw, I don't know, uh, I, I don't know who Anna Shaw is, so um, I'm just going to preface this by saying I'm sure it's full of historical inaccuracy and uh, lies we tell our children. I just won't necessarily know what they are. One of, the one of these pioneer girls, who certainly would have been a patrol leader, was Anna Shaw. In 1859, a 12-year-old girl with her mother and four other children, she traveled in a rough cart full of bedding and provisions into the Michigan woods where they took up a claim, settling down into a log cabin whose only furniture was a fireplace of wood and stones. She and her brothers floored this cabin with lumber from a mill and actually made partitions, an attic door, and windows. They planted potatoes and corn by chopping up the sod, putting seed under it, and leaving it to nature, who rewarded them by giving them the best corn and potatoes Dr. Shaw ever ate, she says in her autobiography. For she became a preacher and a physician, a lecturer and organizer, this sturdy little Girl Scout, even though she had to educate herself mostly. They papered the cabin walls with, old mag with the old magazines after they had read them uh, and went over... Blah. They papered the cabin walls with the old magazines after they had read them once and went all over them in this fashion later. So eagerly did she devour the few books sent them from the East, that when she entered college years later, she passed her examinations on what she remembered of them. They lived on what they raised from the land. The pigs they brought in uh, the wagon with them, fish caught with wires out of an old hoop skirt, and cornmeal brought from the nearest mill 20 miles away. Ox teams were the only means of getting about. Anna and her brothers made what furniture they used, bunks, tables, stools, and a settle, uh, she learned to cut trees and heart logs like a man. After a trying season of carrying all the water used in the household from a distant creek which froze in the winter so that they had to melt the ice, they finally dug a well. First, they went as far as they could with spades, 
then handed buckets of earth to each other, standing on a ledge halfway down. Then, when it was deep enough, they lined it with slabs of wood. It was so well made that the family used it for 12 years. Um, we may need uh, to give some pun points to the 1932 Girl Scouts of America handbook because they dug a well and it was well made. Um, <clears throat> wild beasts prowled around them. Indians terrified them by sudden visits. Uh, sorry, I missed that. Um, historical terms. Indigenous folk uh, terrified them by sudden visits. The climate was rigorous, amusements and leisure... Uh, the climate was rigorous, amusements and leisure scanty. But this brave, handy girl met every job that came to her with a good heart and a smile. She learned by doing. The tests and sports which we earn badges for, for mastering were life's ordinary problems to her, and very practical ones. She never knew it, but surely she was a real Girl Scout. Our British Scout sisters call themselves Girl Guides, and here is the thrilling reason for this title, given by Chief Scout and founder of the whole big band that is spreading round the world today as so many of Old England's great ideas have spread. Uh, and then we have a section on why guides that harkens back to stuff that we read earlier. Uh, just the part where we just left off was talking about the great ideas from old England that had spread around the world. Oh boy, there's a lot to unpack in that statement. Yes, people terrified them by sudden visits. His very strong introvert energy. It's like when the telephone goes off. Oh my gosh, no. Um, all right, I think I'm done reading through their history at the moment. Um, Girl Scout laws. So, they have the same salute as the Boy Scouts. The three finger, I can't. I can't even do it anymore. My hand is not that flexible. <laughs> I can't do it. Not at present, not with that hand at least. I can do it with my left hand, but not my, my right hand won't, won't do that at the moment. Um, so they have troops, patrols. Again, similar to the Boy Scouts. They have patrol leader, court of honor, captain, lieutenants, lone girl scouts, girls living in rural communities who do not have an opportunity to meet with a sufficient number of girls to form a troop, or who for some uh, good reason are unable to attend troop meetings. Exactly the same program. And the work is carried on through correspondence. because they wanted to make it available to everyone. So no matter where you were, that makes sense. An illustration of the uniform. It is very much a cloche hat. Um, golden eagle pin, life-saving cross. A little GS on the end of their collar. Girl Scout pin crest, first and second class badges, chevrons, child nurse. Oh, I guess those are the badges, uh, proficiency badges. Yeah, child nurse, scholarship, home nurse, first aid. <coughs> Available to everyone. No one is safe from the ideas of England. Um, wow. Oh gosh. I had no idea that so much of the Girl Scouts is honestly identical to the Boy Scouts. There's a lot more emphasis on healthcare and, and some other like home economics and domestic work and stuff like that. But beyond that 
different emphasis? So much of it is the same. Ranks. Tenderfoot. Tenderfoot is the first rank for Boy Scouts, too. And cookies, yeah. Um, it's funny, the first time I visited the Girl Scouts website to, to see the information about uh, what they were doing for the 111th birthday, um, it struck me as just funny uh, to have a notice at the bottom of that page about cookies, meaning internet cookies, not baked goods. Um, but yeah, uh, so Tenderfoot, second class, first class, Those are, those are the first ranks for the Boy Scouts as well. Tenderfoot, second class, first class. Um, I'm guessing, I, w I, would ha I would wonder about today. Uh, so today I know the Boy Scouts goes beyond first class uh, to life and then eagle. Uh, I don't know if the Girl Scouts I assume that they probably also progress beyond first class now, um, but I don't know. Girl Scout browser cookies, I know. I was tempted to accept them because I thought they would taste good. Um, <clears throat> dinner call at camp. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of underlying in what a girl should know about, or what a Girl Scout should know about the flag. We got some songs. Complete with actual, like, music for America the Beautiful. Not send their uses. Do not sell my personal information. Indeed, indeed. Um, that said, we had a old, address in here too. We find them everywhere. Okay, this, these pages on knots could have come from my 1990s Boy Scout manual. They look identical. Not to say that I remember how to do any of these knots. Uh, I mean, the square knot for sure, but. This could have, like, literally, these pages could have been copied from here to there, except for the heading at the top that says Scouting for Girls. I had no idea that A, it was founded by the same person, and B, the bones of it are identical. I had no idea. Like, why do we even have two different organizations at this point? Um, ooh, picture writing. This is interesting. I saw this, I was flipping through pages and Picture writing. Many peoples have used picture writing. I've never seen... This definitely wasn't in the Boy Scout manual. Uh, and our own alphabet is really descended from signs of this kind. The American Indians... Um, <laughs> it's hard to know. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to talk about language here for a second. Uh, Earlier, as I was reading things, and the word Indians came up, I was skipping it. Um, that word, to some people, is considered um, offensive and a word to be avoided. But to large portions of the indigenous population, it is the word they use. Um, so, uh, especially around like this population, I've found there are multiple terms, uh, whether it be 
uh, Indian, American Indian, Indigenous, uh, Native, Native American, all of those get used by members of the community and by, member, by people who are not part of the community. Um, I generally try to err on the side of using indigenous as a term, but the term in use here at Virginia Tech is American Indian. We have, we have a program in American Indian Studies here that we partner with uh, Virginia tribes to, to make happen. Um, and it's called American Indian Studies. Um, so which terms are offensive and which are problematic uh, is debatable, sometimes depends on the person um, I'd say generally, if they are not being used in a derogatory way, um, there's a good chance that you're okay. I try to err on the side of indigenous because it uh, seems to be a more broadly acceptable and less problematic term. Uh, but I just thought, since here we are encountering another form in this same book, uh, that it was worth addressing. Uh, the American Indians used picture writing to a considerable extent. Of course, the symbols used varied in different parts of the country. For example, a pic the picture for home would differ materially depending upon whether the indigenous person uh, lived in a bark wigwam, skin teepee, adobe pueblo, plank house, earth lodge, or grass hut. Certain symbols, however, would be almost universally understood. For example, those for sun, man, lightning, bird, bear. Girl Scouts can work out their own picture writing. Always remembering that the picture used should be as simple and easily understood as possible. Um, we actually came across this, not necessarily picture writing, but um, in a stream last year, the topic of written language came up and um, we were poking into it on... Wait, SCP symbols? Uh, can you please expand that abbreviation because my brain isn't parsing it. Um, the, uh, so we were at some point, I don't remember why, and I don't remember how it came up, um, but we looked at, oh, it was calligraphy and writing. And so we were talking about writing systems and letters and alphabets and stuff like that. And the topic of um, writing systems that had been developed in the Americas came up. And there are no documented alphabets from North America. Like, none. Uh, there's, I think we found one or two in South America or Central America, but no form of written language in North America. But I would argue there is, because they're talking about the picture writing, which was totally a thing, and we didn't talk about it in that stream on calligraphy and lettering. They just, they wrote with pictures, not with an alphabet. So it was more like hieroglyphics used by like Egypt. Um, but yeah, totally like, there was, written communication, it just wasn't alphabetical in nature. Um, okay, yeah, so I don't know what SCP is. Sign talk or gesture language, so sign language. Um, and then they've got semaphore. Secure, contain, protect. A horror setting centered around the SCP foundation, which contains SCPs or anomalies in its walls. Huh? I don't know what, I, I, 
yeah, that is just, I don't, I don't know where that is, um, coming in. Uh, feel free to explain if you want, but my, it's totally going over my head as to, what symbols you were seeing in the book um that yeah so and then there's the full semaphore code they they had um, morse code in here again a lot of this is the same as what would would have been or is in the boy scout handbook too um I'm actually going to put aside the handbook now because uh, we've spent most of the stream just looking at the handbook. Totally fine with me. I think it's really cool to look at as, and, and to just learn. But um, it's a joke. One of the parts of the lore is that people who work in the foundation will leave each other symbols denoting dangers of whatever SCP is in a given room. Okay. It, it totally went over my head. I had no idea what you were what you were referencing. Um, as always, I've spent most of the stream on very little of what I pulled. Um, I am not surprised by this, but let's start looking at some stuff um, quickly. Girl Scout guides and policy pamphlets. Um, so this is a collection of materials that we have here. Uh, we have the patrol roll book. Let's see. Uh, I do not know the date on this. We will find out. It was owned by Betty, Bar Betty Barker, it looks like. Um, got some attendance. 1925 and 1926. I don't see what troop this is for. Four. And we just have that one list of roles for 1925 to 1926. Um, paints. Interesting. Hmm. I don't know. I, uncertain where that's where they were located. Uh, I don't know if the finding aid might have some of that information. Um, let's see, Camp Wind in the Pines, Pioneer Camp. Uh, for girls, 14 to 18. Um, we've got the, that uniform that we recognize from the 1930s handbook. Um, this pamphlet is from the 9th Encampment, July 3rd to August 28th of 1937. And of course they're on horses because um, American culture likes to think that every girl wants a horse. Uh, Massachusetts Girl Scouts Incorporated, Buzzard, Buzzards Bay, RFD, Massachusetts. This is Elise Moody. Thank you, Puddleglum. I'll be interested to learn more. So this is a pamphlet uh, for a Girl Scout camp, it looks like. Camp Wind in the Pines. I like the illustrations on these sorts of things. Um, a trained dietitian supervises the menus and preparation of food. A new refrigeration room has been added this year and the kitchens at the main house are remodeled. The food is wholesome and adequate and the menus well balanced. We ask you to cooperate with us in safeguarding the health of the girls by refraining from sending or bringing food to camp. I actually did uh, work for a little bit at a Boy Scout camp when I was in the Boy Scouts. Um, so seeing some of the things like a reference to a trading post on there uh, are just hitting some bells for me. Camp Four Winds. Uh, 1937, also in Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts, 11th encampment. So this is an older camp. Huh. 
If you want me to spend more time on any of these things, do let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to sort of glance at them and move on because I want to show stuff. Pine Tree Camp, 1936. First National Girl Scout Training School, Plymouth, Massachusetts. wonder if they had the same rule for Boy Scouts about not sending food to camp or if that was just for the girls. I don't know, Hannah. And um, I would, yeah, I don't know. These camps here, according to the, um, see, July 3rd to August 28th, July 3rd to August 21st. And the way they're presented, it seems like they expected the girls to be there that entire time, which is basically two months. Uh, the Boy Scout camp that I worked at, scouts came for a week at a time. It was only the people who worked there, only like the camp counselors that were there for longer. Um, but that's the 1930s, and when I was, it, it was like the early 90s, so. Uh, Pine Tree Camp, summer schedule. Starting in June, ending in, at the end of August. Got some bios on camp counselors. Did it say where this one was? It didn't. I don't see that it says where this camp is located. Day camping. I'm guessing Massachusetts. Yep. Plymouth, Massachusetts. I think all of these, I think this whole collection is like Massachusetts. Um, interesting. The Blue Book of Girl Scout Policies and Procedures. So what is the Blue Book? Ah, okay. This is the rule book for use by the adults who run the troops. The, the official reference book of the National Organization for the Use of its Adult Membership. My mom actually worked for a time at the Boy Scouts National Office in D.C. Um, which was right near uh, like the local regional offices for the Girl Scouts, but copyright 1948 by Girl Scouts, official reference book on the policies and procedures. Four ideals seem particularly important, belonging, resourcefulness, service, and world friendship. world friendship. This extends the idea of belonging to the whole world. Our generation is world-minded. World friendship is one of the needs of the times, which is the duty of Girl Scouts to help fill. That statement in this book from 1948 uh, could have been written today. You know, might might have gotten a, a more succinct history had we read the one in here instead of the one in the in the in the book for the actual like uh, scouts. <laughs> but this is what what our adventures are like. I didn't know this book was even here because we discover things together. I I don't know what's in these collections until I open them up on stream usually. 
Um, oh, yes, okay, so this is, I wanna make sure that we look at at least one, hopefully more than one, of these architecture collections, because when I went searching, I was like, oh, it makes perfect sense, but it never occurred to me that there would be a lot of like Girl Scout related things in the International Archive of Women in Architecture. And there were, and so like this first one here, this is from the uh, Jean Young architectural collection, or the Jean Young uh, papers, Jean Linden Young papers. Um, and so uh, this folder just says, um, Girl Scout Silver Totem Award Design. So again, we're gonna get some indigenous imagery. It may or may not be accurate, uh, but this is accurate to Girl Scouts of America um, in that this award incorporating a totem was designed for Girl Scouts by uh, Jean Linden Young. Um, I do not know if this was for national use or if this was for um, local use. Let me see if I can find out. This is, uh, let's see, a letter from 1972. Dear Jean, sorry it has been over 10 days since we talked. I have made many experiments and think and think idea I shall be able to do the totems. I think that's, I do not know that word for sure. But, um, However, the price um, will have to be increased to $20. If you still want me to do them at this price, let me know as soon as possible, as I want to make them slowly, uh, not under pressure. Now. Wow. And no, that makes sense in context. I can see it, but also I definitely didn't see it before. Um, so let's see. Dear Sarah, we are delighted to hear that you feel you have found a method for producing the Totem Award sculptures, which will work more readily. I think the council will approve the $20 per figure uh, and I have also suggested that they try to estimate a two year or so supply so that there would be a larger number on an order. I presume your experiments will not necessitate any major changes in the nature of the award since you did not mention this in the letter. Uh, Totem has said they would get their order in earlier to allow you more time for their production. Hmm. Enclosed with this letter are some copies of articles which have appeared on the receiving of the award, which we thought you might like to see. We feel it is a unique award and is very well received. A copy of your letter, as well as this one, is being forwarded to Totem Council, and I am sure you will hear from them soon. My apologies for not getting an answer to you sooner, but since receiving your letter, I've had an, uh, yeah, some medical issues. Let's see. Copy. So this was um, apparently Seattle. <laughs> so we've got some, I'm trying to see if the article is here talking about what this award was for. And totem imagery is not uncommon in the Seattle area. So that, let's see. Totem sculpture, highest recognition presented to persons in the area who have given far reaching service of lasting benefit to the Girl Scouts. The area within the Totem Council of Girl Scouts includes 10 counties of Northwest Washington. So the Totem Council would be like, um, you've got patrols, which are just the girls, like subunits of troops, which are like local organization. And then above the troops is the council, um, which can span 
a, a large geographic area uh, covering multiple municipalities and, and um, so the apparently the Seattle area one, at least in 72, was called the Totem Council. So uh, it, this is an award that was given to people who uh, gave far lasting service of lasting or far reaching service of lasting benefit to the Girl Scouts. Um, and so yeah, Jean Young, this architect, actually designed what this award looked like. And I think it's the illustrations are nice. I, I enjoy you can see like the very um, very typical architect uh, lettering here at the bottom. But and then there's also this larger version of uh, I, I will zoom out. This is a needlepoint design uh, of like for the totem council. So this would be potentially like what could be used to actually make say a patch to go on a uniform. Because you could use needlepoint to do something like that, or to just, you know, needlepoint directly onto a uniform and, and get this actual design on there. I think it's cool. So that was the first thing I found when I actually started looking at some of the um, architect or, or architecture records that uh, popped when I started searching for Girl Scouts and stuff. Um, oh gosh, we didn't even get to recipes. I don't have anything specifically about Girl Scout cookies. Um, I've got various campgrounds that were designed. So a lot of the architecture stuff ends up being like, they did landscape design for a Girl Scout camp or something like that. Um, which would have been really interesting if I had the time to dig into them. <laughs> but like I said, I was really surprised by how much I came across. Um, we do have this Campbell's Cooking with a, Pur cooking with a Purpose for Girl Scouts. Um, most of what we have related to the Girl Scouts is mostly because we have a history of food and drink collection. Most of these items we have because they have something associated with recipes or cooking skills or stuff like that. Um, so let's see, uh, maybe one recipe or so. No time for recipes, I know, I know. We have soups under special, shepherdess's pie, after school snacks that count, perk up chili pronto, sunset zipper. When is this book from? Oh, I don't know. Because it wasn't cataloged individually as part of the collection. Looks like 1974, June of 1974. Uh, Rosie Frappe. Cheesy Benedict, Pork Chops Champ, Scouts Color Course, Mystery Juice. Mystery Juice? I am horrified. Which means I should read it. Let's look at Mystery Juice. Because it's not something I want to consume. Two cups chilled V8 cocktail vegetable juice, a half a cup chilled orange grapefruit juice, one teaspoon of brown sugar, and a generous dash of allspice. Combine the ingredients, serve in chilled glasses. Mix four servings. Um, I'm gonna say no thank you on that one. <laughs> These seem to be cursed in the way that a lot of 70s recipe books are cursed. 
Uh, you're not wrong. Also, um, 16-Bit Eric, hi, welcome. Thank you so much for bringing the Whimsies by. I hope that your uh, stream went well. Um, we have been uh, hanging out today, looking at materials from the archives. Um, and today's focus is the Girl Scouts of America because they turned 111 years old this week. And so I dug through the archives and found everything I could about the Girl Scouts of America. We spent a lot of time looking at the Girl Scout Handbook from 1932, uh, but yeah, welcome in everybody. It's great to have you join. Um, if anybody here is not already following 16-Bit Eric, um, Eric is a wonderful streamer who uh, is very, very knowledgeable about tabletop role-playing games um, and routinely talks about that, but then also just uh, brings up various topics, knows a lot about a lot of stuff. Um, I honestly have learned more about Buddhism from watching his streams than uh, I had ever known before. And um, definitely worth a follow. It's a great community and uh, often joins us here. So uh, thank you again, uh, Eric, and welcome in everybody from Eric's stream. Um, we are technically over time. I'm just sort of speed running through a couple of the things that we pulled and then we'll find somewhere to go um, because I'm going to have to pack up and head home. But um, we, we, we're presently looking at Campbell's Cooking with a Purpose uh, for Girl Scouts. It's a, a cookbook, June of 1974 um, from Campbell's for... Girl Scouts, and we found this recipe, mystery juice, that is, in my opinion, somewhat terrifying, because it is V8 cocktail vegetable juice with some orange grapefruit juice, brown sugar, and allspice. which just does not sound, it doesn't sound like a good time to me. Other people, you know, somebody liked it or it wouldn't be in here, right? Uh, tuna mac togetherness, party pot roast, babysitters special, five brown and served sausage links sliced, uh, one can of Franco-American SpaghettiOs in tomato and cheese sauce, and a half a cup of cooked corn. I could see those on the plate near one another, but like together in a dish seems weird. Chicken a la Statesman, old time gingerbread, made with tomato soup. This is honestly not, not as surprising to me as it might have been. Um, thanks to having watched Emmy Made um, doing Depression Era food. Uh, Emmy Made in Japan, if you're unfamiliar, is a YouTube channel. Um, and she has a couple of different series, but one of them she makes Depression Era recipes. And uh, from that series, I did learn that, yeah, you can use tomato soup in things like brownies. Um, two cans of Campbell's tomato soup, three eggs, two packages of gingerbread mix, a cup of raisins, and a cup of chopped walnuts. I'm curious about what is in gingerbread mix. I've made gingerbread before. I've only ever made it from scratch though, so I don't know what's in the mix. Um, do you just go to the store and there's like a box labeled gingerbread mix? Because I don't know that I've ever seen that. Uh, blend the soup and eggs, add the gingerbread mix, blend at low speed until thoroughly moistened, beat two minutes on medium speed. So this is, the instructions are essentially the same as like for making uh, a boxed cake mix or something like that from the store. <laughs> um, let's see, what else, what else? I thought we were further into the stack. Um, we have Tramping and Trailing with the Girl Scouts. 
Another really gorgeous cover, honestly. I love the silhouettes. The 1932 um, handbook that had the silhouettes on the cover, this, this feels really similar. This is also, let's see, what was the year on Tramping and Trailing? 1927, so slightly before. Hi, Blue Rooster, welcome. The same art style. I think it's great. I love it. I just really love it. Um, I don't know what tramping and trailing with the Girl Scouts is. Chapter one, be prepared. Chapter two, on the way. Three, the safe side. Four, a number of things. Then we've got eight programs for hikes. Then chapter five, out of door housekeeping. Six, the campfire. Seven, the larder. Eight, the overnight hike. Nine, sing along. The trail in retrospect. I think this is a hiking guide. You just remembered something tangentially related to old timey cooking recipes. You're part of an American girl, girl club, like based around the dolls, okay? Put on your, or by a friend's mom. You were supposed to bring some food to a party themed around Molly, a World War II era doll, which was around the time that box mixes and other convenience foods really started to take off. Got hectic and busy and were short on time to make something. So your mom and you agreed that you would do Bisquick biscuits and explained it as us using convenience foods as Molly or her mom might have done. No, that's a great story, Puddleglum. I don't know exactly the date of when Bisquick came out. Um, we definitely have pamphlets related to Bisquick in the same collection that that Girl Scout pamphlet was from. Um, we, have, we have some really nice uh, culinary ephemer ephemera stuff, and we've looked at some of it on stream, but um, I could do something on like the introduction of convenience foods and boxed mixes and stuff. <laughs> you were lurking on Eric's stream and stumbled into this? Well, it is great to have you here, Blue Rooster. Um, yeah, this is a show that I do once a week, um, and we, are, we look at different things from the archives. Um, I am the community collections archivist at Virginia Tech, and I've been doing this for about two years now, where I just decide on a topic and uh, we explore it together on stream. Usually I don't even know. Um, I think it's just adventure, Lord Portico. Uh, most of the time I've never even looked at the things before, other than maybe a cursory look to grab a graphic for the starting soon screen. Um, but yeah, kettles and campfires, out of doors, cooking, cooking out of doors. We've got a lot of cookbooks here, but that's because we have the history of food and drink collection, which is why we have these. And I wish that I could stay and spend a whole bunch more time here. Is it not? Uh, but I am definitely going to run out of time because um, it is 20 minutes until 5 and um, I do have to break down ev the setup in this room and um, pick up people for the commute home. Uh, you know, if that one is not on that channel, I have. text, because the adventure command exists on the other channel. Um, where I go by Archivist Anthony. Uh, but yes, <laughs> we can add that to the uh, Rogan 27 Mubot as well. Um, but yes, <sighs> this was all like nine months ago, I noticed, or I noticed something. I don't know what it was in the collections, but I, I saw something that was Girl, Girl Scouts related. And I was like, I should do a stream on whatever I can find on the Girl Scouts in our collections. And I decided to schedule it for today because the 111th birthday of the Girl Scouts of America was this past Sunday. And we had a fun time. Honestly, we spent two full hours just looking at 
The history of the Girl Scouts as presented in this handbook from the early 1930s um, and marveling at just how similar the organization is to the Boy Scouts of America, uh, which I was already familiar with. I just did not have any idea how similar the two organizations were and was pleasantly surprised. Um, I do sadly have to start moving us toward um, a raid uh, because I do have to pack up and get going. Um, but let's, uh, let's just review. Um, coming up next week on Archival Adventures, um, I will be looking at materials about uh, women's suffrage. I believe 99% of them are going to be women's suffrage in the United States. Um, but uh, that will be my, my like women's month, women's history month um, stream. Although the next week and the week after are both like materials about women or but next week, women's suffrage. It's been a couple of years since the 100th anniversary of um, the 14th Amendment. Um, and I did an exhibit on the 14th Amendment when uh, the, that anniversary was happening and realized I've never streamed with that material. So I pulled uh, the stuff from the exhibit as well as a couple of things that we got since then. And those are what I will have here to look at next week. Of course, the week after will be the, the last Wednesday in uh, March, and we will have an episode of the High Energy Physics series. Um, this time, uh, we'll be looking at the Kathleen Cruz collection, which is part of the International Archive of Women in Architecture. It is indeed an architecture collection, and I'm pulling it for the High Energy Physics series. So uh, you'll have to come by and find out why. Um, so yeah, every Wednesday, 2.30 p.m. Um, here on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios or twitch.tv slash Rogan27, um, we dive in and look at stuff from the archives. Uh, for anyone who might be in the Blacksburg, Virginia area tomorrow, uh, the Reading Room has a special open house tomorrow afternoon from 5.15 till 7.30 p.m. Um, featuring Women's Stories in the Archives as a, a special event for Women's History Month. So if you happen to be in the area in Southwest Virginia and you want to stop by the library um, and just pop into the Special Collections Reading Room, uh, that event is happening tomorrow. Um, I, I can point the right direction, I really can. And um, I will update next week as to whether I will be live on the 1st of April for a special um, WUVT 75th anniversary episode, uh, which is a possibility. Um, let me see where we are rating. I don't think... So Stephen is up which is good. Also, the Monterey Bay Aquarium is live. Um, they have the Kelp Forest Cam going. Uh, Steven playing a game called We Took That Trip, it looks like. Um, those are the two that we typically raid. Uh, any votes? I'm guessing, Puddle Glum, are you, are you voting for raiding Steven? Because I'm totally up for that. Or I could, I could, I could look and see if there's anything else Girl Scouts related. Because that's a possibility. Let me just do a quick check. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> I'm not surprised. So, yeah. Okay, we will raid Stephen Joyce. Uh, Stephen Joyce is a uh, variety streamer from 
Scotland, um, who is just a, a joy, a joy to watch. Stephen Joyce is a joy to watch. Um, I know works in higher education uh, and um, has a number of librarians that uh, watch his streams. Um, so I try to have some connection to libraries uh, with, with my uh, raids, but it's not required, honestly. All right. I will get those to ticking. Uh, thank you all so very much for joining me today. I hope that um, this look at the Girl Scouts, uh, you know, brought them to mind and uh, maybe made you appreciate them a little bit. It certainly made me appreciate them a little bit more than I had previously because I learned a bunch. Um, I hope that I will see you again soon for another Archival Adventures. Until I do, keep exploring history.